All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, can everybody hear me still? Good evening. Okay, great. All right. Good evening. We certainly want to welcome each and every one of you to our online um, virtual Bible study. We certainly appreciate each of you uh, coming online uh, to study the Word of God with us here at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And uh, we're certainly grateful that you've taken some time out of your uh, evening to, uh, to be a part of our worship experience uh, through Bible study. Uh, my name is Reverend Gilbert Ham Jr. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm one of the um, associate ministers here at Ebenezer, and it's indeed my pleasure to welcome you. And just so, just a little housekeeping when you guys, uh, you know, will come on, uh, just so that we can have a, a clean uh, study. We can make sure that you're on mute. Um, that way, you just kind of we can kind of, kind of limit a lot of the background noise or any of the background noise. You know, certainly come off of mute if you're able to, just to be able to say, you know. Uh, you know, give pastors some feedback because it does help. But if if not, we like to keep um, you know keep the line uh, clear so we could be free of any background noise. Amen. Um, and so we certainly appreciate that. Um, I ask that each of you uh, just keep my wife in prayer. Uh, unfortunately, she um, uh, she has an accident. She fell and she uh, broke her ankle on Monday, oh, on Monday morning. Oh. Um, fortunately, it was uh, broken in uh, so two places. Uh, one of the uh, bones kind of, um, yeah, kind of shattered a little bit. Unfortunately, she, oh, uh, in, an, in the evening, she was uh, getting out of the bed um, mm. and must have uh, stepped on a pillow and just completely... Um, you know, her, all of her, all of her weight must have fell on her, on her, and um, and so um, you know, obviously, um, just was in in, in a lot of pain, very, uh, very scary situation because of the the way the foot looked. It was pretty much kind of like dangling a little bit. That's how bad mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. Um, but I praise God. I, I say that in prayer, but also give a praise report because when we went uh to the, to the ER. Uh, and they saw it. They said that they wanted to work on it right away. I say it's a praise report because they say normally, just because of the workload, they normally would send you home and then put you on a schedule, and mm -hmm. then you would have to come back and mm -hmm. have the operation. But thanks be to God that uh, they had a space opening and available for that day. And mm -hmm. so she was hey, able to get uh, mm -hmm. surgery that day. And so uh, we certainly praise God that we didn't have to come home, 
that they opened up and the surgeons, they were even saying this is not saying unusual, but they was like, this normally don't happen. <laughs> you know, we normally don't have same day appointments, you know, for surgery, you know, not just appointments for surgery, you know, emergency mm-hmm. surgery. And so I thank God that he, even in the midst of what would seem to be um, tragedy uh, in a sense, but that God still showed his grace by yes. showing her favor, Amen. Amen. by Amen. allowing that. And then the doctor then to come through, uh, through surgery, you know, with no problems. Uh, it mm-hmm. went very well. You know, now she's just obviously home. Um, you know, she's going to be, you know, they did, they said that she's going to be down for about four months. Um, mm-hmm. because of the, uh, the, just the way it was. But again, I say that, uh, one to keep, keep her in prayer as she, you know, of course enters uh, rehab and just for us, but I also say it as a praise report, because even in the midst of that, we saw God, amen. Mm-hmm. We saw the favor of God amen. moving on our behalf and giving us favor, you know, amen. so, uh, just please keep amen. us in prayer. Um, we appreciate that. So it gives me great pleasure to go ahead and introduce our pastor, Pastor Gilbert mm-hmm. S. Ham, uh, Senior, uh, who's our Bible study teacher for this evening. So uh, Pastor Ham, without further ado, sir, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, son. Uh, to those of you who have joined us uh, by the way of Zoom and to all of you who are online tonight, we uh, certainly Uh, Thank God uh, for your presence tonight. And uh, before we begin our study, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Mm. Father, first of all, we thank you for keeping us safely throughout last night Mm. and then willing that we see this another day that you have made. We Mm. thank you for your divine protection throughout this day, because unknowingly some of us might have gone through uh, some unseen dangers. So we thank you always for your divine protection. Thank you for this opportunity once again to study your word, uh, which is forever settled in heaven. And we thank you for your word because your word gives us to know who we are in Christ. And you made Mm -hmm. uh, Christ Jesus to uh, be made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And we are complete in him. So we thank you for what your word have have described uh, for us. Now we do know that the Holy Spirit, he is the divine teacher. And I pray that he will continue to open up our understanding that we may understand the scriptures. And I pray that all that shall be said and done tonight will be pleasing in your sight and that it will bring you glory and honor. And we ask it all in Jesus name, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, as you know, our subject of study is exorcism in a synagogue. And of course, the foundation scriptures, let me give them to you again, is Mark uh, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, and Luke uh, chapter 4, verses 31 through 37. Once again, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, and Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 37. Now, last Wednesday, uh, one of the points that we were looking at was the teaching about the miracle, the teaching about the miracle. And the first point that we looked at was the presence of Christ for the teaching. The presence of Christ for the teaching. The second point that we looked at was the policy of the synagogue for the teaching. The policy of the synagogue for the teaching. And let me just say this, uh, once my son will put this uh, on the website, you will be able to see everything that was uh, 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 expressed under those two points. And so what I I would like to do tonight is to revisit uh, the first, the third point that is, 
and move on to some uh, fresh material. And the third point I want to revisit is this, the priority of the ministry of teaching. The, priori the priority the priority of the ministry of teaching. And so what I said last Wednesday was this, that Christ did not spend most of his time doing miracles. He spent most of his time teaching. Once again, Christ did not spend most of his time doing miracles, he spent most of his time teaching. Now, if you look at Mark chapter number one and look at verse number 21, look at Mark uh, chapter number one and verse 21. And of course, this is Bible study, so you should have your Bibles. Amen. Now, Mark chapter 1 and verse 21 says, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue. And what did he do? And taught. He entered into the synagogue and taught. And of course, there were many scriptures that I gave you last Wednesday. I'm not going to uh, go through all of that as I first stated once uh, uh, these lessons are put on our website, you'll be able, you'll be able to see all of the scriptures that we uh, looked at uh, uh, last Wednesday. So once again, Christ did not spend most of his time doing miracles, he spent most of his time teaching. Now, this fact is evidence in his interest in teaching in the synagogues on the Sabbath. The people, of course, preferred miracles over teaching. The people, of course, preferred miracles over teaching. And remember that I said last when the well, last when people generally prefer something that is more entertaining to that which is more educational. Once again, people generally prefer something that is more entertaining to that which is more educational. However, we need teaching more than the entertainment in our churches. Once again, we need teaching more than the entertainment in our churches. But our churches, sisters and brothers, are evidencing a problem here mm -hmm. with an increased emphasis, listen now, on plays, dramas, musicals, suppers, and banquets, and a decrease emphasis on preaching and teaching the word of God. I said last Wednesday, we see many churches adjusting their program to that which appeals to the flesh instead of that which appeals to the spirit. And it has made the church corrupt, weak, and powerless. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the fourth point, and we'll begin with some new material. And the fourth point is this, sisters and brothers, the praise for the teaching. The praise for the teaching. 
Now, once again, I want you to look at Mark uh, chapter number one and verse number 22 and note Mark's report, Mark one and verse 22. We're, we're looking down at the praise for the teaching, the praise for the teaching. And so Mark says in verse number uh, 22, and they were astonished at his doctrine or at his teaching. Listen now, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Once again, and they were astonished at his doctrine or at his teaching, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Jesus taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And so we see the synagogue crowd was very impressed with Christ's teaching. The synagogue crowd was very impressed with Christ's teaching. Now, the word translated astonished means to be exceedingly struck in mind. Once again, to those of you who might be writing, the word translated astonished means to be exceedingly struck in mind, to expel by a blow or to drive out by a blow or to force out by a blow, to strike one out of self-possession. Now, today, we would say, blow your mind or be put out of your senses to describe the great surprise and wonder at the teaching of Christ. Now, both the message that is doctrine and the manner authority of Christ's teaching, note now, astonished the people in the synagogue. In other words, it, it, it blew their mind in today's language. And so let's look at the uh, praise for the message of his teaching. The praise for the message of his teaching. Now we see in scripture, they were astonished at his doctrine. They were astonished at his teaching. You see, the message or doctrine or teaching of Christ's teaching was vastly different from the normal fare in the synagogue service. Once again, the message, doctrine of Christ's teaching was vastly different from the normal fare in the synagogue service. You see, the scribes' teaching emphasized the frivolous, tiny, hair-splitting of texts, weary repetition of the sayings of the old, of the men of old, questions connected with the exact keeping of the Sabbath. With the tithing of mint, 
Annis, and Cummin, a singular lack of all dealings with the weightier matters of the law. And so what we have to see, sisters and brothers, is this truth. I want you to turn to Matthew, if you please. Matthew chapter number 23. And I want you to look at verse number 23. Matthew chapter 23. And I want you to look at verse number 23. Now, Christ is straight up. He is straight up. He is straight up. And he tells these Pharisees and scribes who they are. Now, note what he says in verse number 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye paid tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. And he names them judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So what Jesus is saying to these scribes and Pharisees, you religiously tithe. You religiously tithe. But you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, such as judgment, such as mercy, and such is faith. And Jesus said, these ought ye to have done and not to leave what the other undone and not to leave the other undone. So the scribes and Pharisees were neglecting the weightier matters of the law. As I forestated, they were neglecting judgment and 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 and, and, and look what it says mercy and, and faith and, and 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 some has applied even justice and 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 truth. So, so, so Jesus is teaching them with authority. He's teaching them not as the scribes. So the practical heart-searching words of Jesus, listen now, were in strong contrast with the curious but useless themes dwelt on by the official leaders of the day, meaning the scribes and Pharisees. So what am I saying? This is what I'm saying. Christ emphasized the heart. Christ emphasized the heart, not mere outward ritualism. Amen. He emphasized Amen. sincerity, Amen. not show. Mm-hmm. He emphasized grace, not merit, and purity instead of the perverting of the law, listen now, to justify evil. Once again, Christ emphasized the heart, not mere outward ritualism. He emphasized sincerity, not show. He emphasized grace, not merit, and purity instead of the perverting of the law to justify evil. Now listen, 
But though the people were astonished, listen now, but though the people were astonished, they did not readily believe Christ. Isn't that something? Though the people were astonished, they did not readily believe Christ. You see, sisters and brothers, it is one thing for the people to be astonished and amazed at a new doctrine or at a new teaching and to admire the preacher, but another thing to believe. We read of many amongst the Jews that were affected at the hearing of Christ with astonishment and admiration, but a few that believed in him. Isn't that something? And though this new teaching charmed the people, soon it will be rated as heresy by the rabbits and the people will turn against Christ. Listen, sisters and brothers, many preachers have often experienced the same reaction by the people. The people who normally hear empty sermons get excited when someone comes along who can really preach and expound the word of God. It certainly makes the sermon more exciting, but let such a preacher preach a number of times in the church until the truth gets under the skin of the people and they will, in spite of the good preaching, turn against him as they did Christ. Mm. Christ had that experience in Nazareth just prior to coming to Capernaum. You see, when Jesus spoke in the Nazareth synagogue, I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 20, Luke chapter 4 and verse number 22, and I want you to note what's being said there. I want you to turn, please, to Luke chapter number 4 and verse number 22. Now, remember that I said when Christ spoke in the Nazareth synagogue, Scripture says this truth. Look at Luke 4 and verse number 22. I'm just going to read the, actually the first portion of that verse. Note what it says. It says, and all bared him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. So we see that when Jesus came to Nazareth and stood up to read, verse number 22 says, and all bared him witness and wondered at, listen, the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Now, 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 look what happens, sisters and brothers, at what took place at the end of his sermon. Look what took place after Jesus ended his sermon. The truth we will see had gotten to them. The truth had gotten to them. And so I want you to look at verse number 28. Because you see, I'm not going to read verses 23 down to 27, because this is what he says in his sermon. 
And because of this profound truth, this profound truth had gotten under their skin. And note what it says in Luke 4 and 28. Note what it says. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, note what it says, were filled with wrath. <laughs> when Jesus spoke that truth, beginning in verse 23, I'm not going to read it, down to verse number 27, when they heard that truth that Jesus proclaimed, Verse 28 says, and all they and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Was filled with wrath. Now, listen, in spite of the gracious words, which we read about in verse one, verse number 22 that proceeded out, out of his mouth, in spite of the gracious words. Truth does not sit well with the ungodly, no matter how well it is articulated. Truth does not sit well with the ungodly, no matter how well it is articulated. Now, if you have time, you can read what Jesus preaches in that sermon. Read verses 23 to 28 to 27, and you'll find out why they were filled with wrath. He spoke the truth, and they were filled with wrath. You see, truth has a way of getting under the skin of the ungodly. <laughs> truth, truth has a way of getting under the skin of the ungodly. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on. Let's look at the praise. Let's look at for, let's look at the praise for the manner of his teaching. The praise for the manner of his teaching. All right? If you don't mind, go back over to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse number 22. We're going to look at the praise for the manner of his teaching. The praise, the praise for the manner of his teaching. All right, Mark chapter 1 and verse number 22. Note what it says. It says, and they were astonished at his doctrine or at his teaching. Now, here it is now. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Jesus taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. You see, not only was the message of Christ's teaching different, sisters and brothers, but so was the manner of his teaching different. That's worth repeating. Not only was the message of Christ, Christ's teaching different, but so was the manner of of his teaching different. You see, Jesus taught with authority. He taught with authority, which was not the case with the scribes. Now, if you go over to uh, Luke chapter number four, please. Luke chapter number four. I want you to look at verse number 32, Luke chapter number four. And I want you to look at verse number 32. Now we're going to see a different word because over 
in Mark's account, it says that Jesus taught them as one that had authority. He taught them as one that had authority. Now look at Luke's account. Luke chapter 4, verse 32. Note what it says. And they were astonished at his doctrine or teaching, for his word was with power. For his word was with power. Now, now, he taught with authority, as I forestated, which was not the case with the scribes. Now, the Luke text, the Luke text says power instead of authority. Note, the Luke text says power instead of authority. But listen, but the Greek word is the same. The Greek word is the same. Christ spoke with conviction and dogmatism. He had answers. His message was not one of perhaps or possibly or maybe a perhaps or possibly or maybe type message because that kind of message does not convict anyone or give hope to anyone. But unbelief is filled with that kind of teaching. You see, sisters and brothers, unbelief is never quite sure of anything. And ridiculous and and, and I'm sorry, and 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 and, and ridicules those who say they know some things for certain in spiritual matters. And let me just say that again. Christ spoke with conviction, with conviction and dogmatism. He had answers. His message was not one of perhaps or possibly or maybe a perhaps or possibly or maybe type message, sisters and brothers, does not convict anyone or give hope to anyone. Once again, unbelief, but unbelief is filled with this, with that kind of teaching. Unbelief is never quite sure of anything and ridicules those who say they know some things for certain in spiritual matters. Skepticism is promoted by unbelief. Skepticism is promoted by unbelief. Now, of course, these same people want dogmatism in medicine and money, but they do not want dogmatism in spiritual matters. However, if ever you need authoritative answers anywhere, it is in the matters concerning your soul and its eternal destiny. Listen, sisters and brothers, you cannot afford to be in a state of uncertainty about your eternal destiny. That's so very important for you uh, to take in. You cannot afford to be in a state of uncertainty about your eternal destiny. Now, I want you to see what Jesus said to some of the people of his day. I want you to go to John, the gospel according to John, chapter number eight, 
And I want you to look at verse number 24. Because sisters and brothers, you have to be certain about your eternal destiny. Mm -hmm. You have to be certain. Because all of us are going to leave this world. And we're going to spend eternity somewhere, either with God or apart or separated from God. Now, John chapter number eight, the gospel according to John, chapter number eight, I want you to look at verse number 24, and I want you to see what Jesus says to these group of people as he taught in the temple. Verse number uh, 24 says, Jesus says, I say therefore unto you, listen now, that ye or you shall die in your sins, for if ye or if you believe not that I am he, if you don't believe that I am the Messiah, if you don't believe that I am the Savior, if you don't believe that I am God come in the flesh, look what Jesus says. If you don't believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You don't have to die in your sins, sisters and brothers. You can be certain about your eternal destiny. Mm -hmm. You can be certain without a shadow of a doubt about your eternal destiny. God has made it possible through Jesus Christ, his son, by him dying on the cross. If you put your faith and trust in him, he has and able to secure your eternal destiny. Now, I want you to turn to a very familiar passage of scripture. We said so much that, you know, we, we, we somehow lose the, the significance of what Jesus said. Turn to John chapter number three, very familiar passage of scripture. Very familiar passage of scripture. Um, Look at verse number uh, 16 and 17. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Very familiar passage of scripture. Know what it says. For God so loved the world that includes you and me, that is speaking of humanity God not just loved but he so loved the world so loved you what did he do that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life Look at verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. You hear that? He that believeth on him he that believeth on the Son is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You cannot afford, sisters and brothers, 
to be in a state of uncertainty about your eternal destiny. All of us is going to stand before God one day. Oh, yeah. And even though the unbeliever has not bowed, God says, every knee shall bow mm -hmm. and every tongue shall confess yes. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The devil's going to bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to all the, and the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every demon spirit is going to bow. Hitler is going to bow. Mussolini is going to bow. Everybody is going to bow down. And let me show you that in scripture. I'm not just, um, just saying that for nothing, because remember, the only authority that I have as a teacher, as a preacher, is the word of God. And I want you to see what God says. I want you to turn to the book of Philippians, please. And I want you to look at In fact, we're going to, let's do some reading. We're going to begin with verse number five. Philippians chapter two, and we're going to begin with verse number five. But I'm going to center around on verses 10 and 11. All right, Philippians chapter number two and verse number five. Note what it says. It says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Look what it says. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That is, though he was, though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights. But look what it says but made himself of no reputation. Now, what did he do? And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Verse eight, and being found in the fashion as a man, what did Jesus do? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. And because of the fact that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, note what God did in verse nine, verse nine, wherefore God also have highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Here it is now, verses 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, Every knee, mm -hmm. every means every, right? Mm -hmm. Every, every mm -hmm. knee should bow. Yes. Look, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue, every means every, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus mm -hmm. Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's move on. Let's look at the trouble prompting the miracle. The trouble prompting the miracle. And I'm so glad that those of you who have joined us by the way of Zoom and those of you who are online, I'm so glad that all of you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. To God be the glory. Because Jesus said, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. So each Wednesday, 
when you join uh, me and my little feeble way of teaching uh, Bibles, uh, the Bible, uh, 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 you're hungry and you're thirsting after righteousness. And Jesus said, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be filled. And remember yeah, that I said, yes, we said. Mm -hmm. I was saved in 1962 and went into the ministry in 1965. And do you not know I'm still learning? And the reason why I'm still learning is because I have a teachable spirit. I mean, I have many books. I, I mean, I have many books, different scholars, and, and look at their teaching, and 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 because I'm willing uh, 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 to learn more, and, and the more I learn, I can share with others. Amen. So let's look at the trouble of prompting the miracle. The trouble prompting the miracle. Now, the miracle of exorcism in the synagogue was prompted by a major disturbance in the synagogue service. The miracle of exorcism in the synagogue was prompted by a major disturbance in the synagogue service. Now to examine this, to examine this trouble in the synagogue service, we want to look at these four things. Number one, the man causing the trouble. The man causing the trouble. Number two, we want to look at the moment of the trouble. The moment of the trouble. Number three, the manner of the troubling. The manner of the troubling. And number four, the message in the troubling. I will repeat those again. Number one, the man causing the trouble. Number two, the moment of the trouble. Number three, the manner of the troubling. And number four, the message in the troubling the message in the troubling. So let's look at the first point, the man causing the trouble. The man causing the trouble. Now I need you to go to Luke, please. Luke chapter number uh, four. Please go to Luke chapter number four. And we're going to look at verse number uh, 33. We're going to see the man causing the trouble. The man causing the trouble. Causing this major disturbance in the synagogue service. All right, Luke, Luke chapter number four. And verse 33, note what it says, note what it says. It says, and in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. Unclean devil. And cried out with a loud voice. And in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice and cried out with a loud voice. Now, from this text, from this text, I want to note two things here about the man who caused the trouble in the synagogue service. From this text, 
which we just read, I want to note two things here about the man who caused the trouble in the synagogue service. Number one, they are the pollution of the man. They are the pollution of the man. And number two, the presence of the man. From this text, that is from Luke chapter four, verse 33, I want to note two things here about the man who caused the trouble in the synagogue service. There are, number one, the pollution of the man. And number two, the presence of the man. And I try to go slow enough for those of you uh, who might be writing, amen. So let's look at the pollution of the man. The pollution of the man. You see, the man who caused the trouble in the synagogue service was possessed of an unclean devil or an unclean demon. The fact that there is an unclean devil or demon, listen now, does not mean there are clean demons. That's worth repeating. The man who caused the trouble in the synagogue service was possessed of an unclean devil or demon. The fact that there is an unclean devil or unclean demon does not mean there are clean demons. You see, sisters and brothers, all demons are unclean. All demons are unclean. Now, the word unclean, listen now, simply emphasizes the pollution of the man which the demon caused. Once again, the word unclean simply emphasizes the pollution of the man which the demon caused. That the usurper is here called unclean indicates the moral impurity by which he was characterized, characterized, characterized. That the usurper here, the usurper is here called unclean, indicates the moral impurity by which he was characterized. You see, a demon is an unclean spirit. Go back over to Mark, please. Mark chapter 1. And let's look at verse 20, 23. A demon is an unclean spirit. All right. Mark chapter 1. And note what it says in verse number 23. It says, and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, an unclean spirit. Now, this is in contrast to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all right? Now, this is a man who has an unclean spirit. This is in contrast to the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, remember, sisters and brothers, we are in a war. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, that is against humans, but against principalities, and powers 
against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are against organized evil. As a child of God, we are against organized evil. Now, listen. Those who cause trouble in church, mm. put, put on your seatbelts. <laughs> <laughs> Those who cause trouble in church and disturb the services will be found to be unclean persons in character. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm not calling out any names. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm not calling out any names. But those who cause trouble in church mm. and disturb the services will be found to be unclean persons in character. Amen. Any pastor who has pastored for any length of time will sooner or later learn that church troublemakers do not live holy lives. Mm -mm. These troublemakers may talk about God's love and other noble and other and other no, noble things about God, but that is merely camouflaged to cover up their evil intentions. Mm. Church troublemakers are simply evil people. Mm -hmm. Church mm -hmm. trouble troublemakers are simply evil people. They are not wonderful, sweet, holy people greatly dedicated to the cause of Jesus Christ. Rather, they live on holy lives, and as a result, are out of sorts with God and His ways, and show that in, and show that in opposing those who represent God and His ways. You see, we are up against organized evil. And if you decide, sisters and brothers, to do something for God, the enemy is going to use someone to come up against you with some kind of opposition. You see, we have to learn to look beyond people and look at that spirit that is using that person. I said, we have to look beyond people and see that spirit that's using that person. Mm -hmm. I just quoted scripture. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, human beings, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are fighting an unseen enemy. Mm -hmm. We are fighting Amen. an unseen enemy. Amen. Remember that I said, I think it was two Wednesdays ago, the devil ain't playing with us. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And the devil is not your friend. He is our adversary. And he's going about seeking who he may devour. And sooner or later, he's coming by your house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's coming by your house. Now, let me say this. If you don't have any trouble out of the devil, it means that both of you are going down the same road. But if you have been born again, washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have trouble out of the devil. He's going to come up against you. He is going to come up against you. 
So what we have to do, sisters and brothers, is look beyond the person and see the demon or spirit that is using that person. Amen. That's what we got to do. Now, let's look at the presence of the man. We, 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 just got look, we just got finished looking at the uh, pollution of the man. So now let's look at the presence of the man. And once again, we got to look at Mark chapter number one and verse number 23. We're going to look at the presence of the man, the presence of the man. Look at Mark one and 23. Look what it says. I'm just going to read, read the first portion. Well, let me read it. It said, and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And there was in their synagogue, in their synagogue, in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, it seems strange, sisters and brothers, that an unclean person who is controlled by demons would want to come to the synagogue, a place of the worship of God. But there he was, and that's worth repeating. It seems strange that an unclean person who is controlled by demons would want to come to the synagogue, a place of worship, a place of the worship of God, but there he was. So what am I saying? I'm saying, I'm saying this. The same is true in our churches. The same is true in our churches. You see, not all those who come into the church to attend the services or to become members are clean people. Mm -hmm. Ah, my, I'm, I'm, I'm going down a rough road. Amen. Speaking. Not all those who come into church to attend the services or to become members are clean people. Hey, son. Hey, you son. would think, you would think the unholy would not want to be in or part of a church. I mean, you would think the unholy would not want to be in or part of a church, but they often are. Mm -hmm. You see, even Jesus had to betray a Judas as a disciple. I said, even Jesus had to betray a Judas as a disciple. Amen. So it is possible that those who are very much under the power and working of Satan may be found in the synagogue among the worshipers of God. Amen. Amen. These dirty souls deceive others in order to get in the church Amen. and to do their devilish work. Amen. These dirty souls. Now, now, don't, don't, don't leave Bible study and say I called out some names. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I ain't called no names. Mm -hmm. I just said these dirty souls deceive others in order to get in the church and do their devilish work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're like snakes. They slime. Mm -hmm. slip their way in. Their goal is not worship, but wreck, but wrecking. You hear what I said? The mm -hmm. goal mm -hmm. is not worship, but 
wrecking. You, you, you see, this man, this man, listen now, this man did not come to the synagogue to be taught the word or to be healed of his condition, but to oppose Christ and hinder the people from believing. Mm -hmm. This man, we just read about it in Mark 1 and 23, this man did not come to the synagogue to be taught the word or to be healed of his condition, but to oppose Christ and hinder the people from believing. Listen, church troublemakers are no different and need to be recognized for their real character. Amen. Do not be surprised to find the unclean on the church rolls. Do not be surprised to find the unclean on the church rolls. The church rolls are filled with them and they are no good for the church. Mm -hmm. They need to be dealt with firmly and forcibly as Christ dealt with this unclean spirit if the church is to progress. They got to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. They got to be dealt with, dealt with firmly and, and, and forcibly. As I forced as Christ dealt with this unclean spirit, if the church is to progress. Now we looked at the uh, pollution of the man. We just looked at the presence of the man. So let's move on to the next point. Let's look at the moment of the trouble. The moment of the trouble. The moment of the trouble. It was right after the people praised Christ's message and manner of teaching that the unclean spirit caused trouble in the synagogue service. It was right after the people praised Christ's message and manner of teaching that the unclean spirit caused trouble in the synagogue service. Look at, look at, look at, look at, look at, look, look at Mark 1 and 22. Bears what I just said. It says, and they were astonished at his doctrine or at his teaching, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes, and as aforestated, stated, it was right after the people praised Christ's message and manner of teaching that the unclean spirit caused trouble in the synagogue service. You see, sisters and brothers, when divine truth was, pro was proclaimed with excellence and the divine son was praised, the unclean spirit interrupted the service and made an ugly scene. When divine truth was proclaimed with excellence and the divine son was praised, the unclean spirit interrupted the service and made an ugly scene. Listen, this problem still exists today. For when the written word of God is preached well, and the incarnate word of God is thereby exalted, evil always get, gets upset. The devil and his demons will not sit idly by when this kind of message is declared. 
it's worth repeating. I know I'm being repetitious, repetitious. But when divine truth was proclaimed with excellence and the divine son was praised, the unclean spirit interrupted the service and made an ugly scene. Hmm. And as, as unfortunately, this problem still exists today. For when the written word of God is preached well, and the incarnate word of God is thereby exalted, evil always gets upset. Mm -hmm. The devil and his demons will not sit idly by when this kind of message is declared. Listen, if you are a preacher who has put much emphasis on preaching the word of God and exalting and exalting of the son of God and has been hit with trouble in the church at the same time, do not be surprised. The cause of the trouble is very obvious. You see, in preaching the word of God and exalting the son of God, you have stirred up evil. You have stirred up evil, unregenerate and disobedient and carnal church members will not like the honoring of divine truth. Amen. It gets under their skin and goes counter to their way of life. Don't preach about my sins. Make me feel comfortable in my sins. But God says, cry aloud and spare not. Show my people their sins. Mm -hmm. And good gospel preaching will point out people's sins as to where they are. Because the word of God will find you where you are. Mm -hmm. Amen. And the word of God will convict you in order to bring change in your life. God loves us so much that he will not allow us to remain where we are. He loves us too much. He loves us too much. And that's what good Bible preaching and teaching will do. It will benefit the believer, but it, it will stir up evil. Because the devil don't like that kind of good preaching and exalting the son of God. He don't like it. He don't like it. Listen. It gets under their skin and goes counter to their way of life. And as a result, sisters and brothers, they will cause trouble in the church and for the preacher. But let the preacher be a compromiser and proclaim a polluted message. And troublemakers will get along with him just fine. Preaching the truth. Preaching the truth stirs up in hornet's nest of opposition. Mm -hmm. But preaching a corrupted message helps to keep the evil ones quiet. <laughs> when preachers preach a corrupted message, it helps to keep the evil ones quiet. Mm -hmm. We just read, when they praise Jesus, and were astonished at his teaching of how he taught them with, with authority and not as the scribes, it stirred up that evil spirit in that man. And he cried out. And I often think, you know, uh, I, when I get finished preaching, I just don't want to make people stronger in the Lord. But if I make some people mad, then I really have preached. <laughs> some people leave out of the church mad. 
who you think he is. <laughs> that's good preaching. And that's good teaching because everybody don't go out shouting and throwing up their hands. Somebody's leaving out of there mad because the preacher has touched on one of their pet sins. <laughs> I want to feel comfortable in my sins. But no good preaching and good teaching won't make you comfortable in your sins. Mm -hmm. And you ought to thank God for that. You ought to thank God for that, that he won't allow you to remain comfortable in your sins. Amen. 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 Now, as I forestated, preaching a corrupt message helps keep the evil ones quiet. So in view of this fact, it is evident that many large and popular churches are not proclaiming divine truth faithfully. Now, I'm not against mega churches. But let me say this, and, 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 and please don't take it out of context. Everything that swells Maybe because of infection. Huh? Yeah. E everything that swells or, or that is swollen might be because of infection. Mm -hmm. Now, people tend to join churches that make them comfortable in their sin. They 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 find teachers because they got itchy ears. I want you to make me feel comfortable in my way of life. Everything large may be because of infection. Let me move on. Let me move on. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move on. Now, I, you know, God knows I, I, I'm trusting the Lord to, to, to grow us numerically, you know, but it's, it's his work. Mm -hmm. And as I forced it, I think last Wednesday, I'm not going to use any gimmicks to grow Ebenezer. Mm -hmm. Ebenezer have to be grown by the word of God. Amen. And every time I stand up, I may not please everybody, but I'm doing my very best for the Lord. I'm preaching the best I can. It may not please everybody, but I'm doing the best I can. You want to get the gospel. You want to get the good news. Mm -hmm. Because we hear enough bad news. At least when you come to church, you ought to hear some good news. Good news. Yeah. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is good news. So let's move on. Let's, 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 oh my God. I'm look, just looking at my watch. Let's look at the manner of the troubling. The manner of the troubling. I might be able to just touch on this before we close tonight. Uh, go, go over to uh, Luke once again. Go back over to Luke uh, chapter four and verse 33. We're going to look at the, the manner of the troubling, the manner of the troubling. Luke chapter 4 and verse 33. The manner of the troubling. All right, it says, and in the synagogue there was a man, now here it is, which had a spirit of an unclean devil, Note what it says, and cried out with a loud voice, and cried out with a loud voice. Now, the words translated cried out as much are much stronger than that. 
and actually mean a scream. The word translated cried out are much stronger than that and actually mean a scream. The two words translated loud voice when put together give us our English word megaphone. It was thus a very loud disturbance. This loud crying out in the synagogue was terribly ill-mannered. It got the attention of the people, but how rude. There was no respect in the screaming interruption of the message. But this ill-mannered action by the demon-possessed man is typical of those who oppose Christ and the gospel. Church troublemakers are like this. They have few manners. They are rude and disrespectful and will do such thing as abruptly take the floor in church business meetings to say their piece regardless if others have the floor or if proper rules of a business meeting are followed. Good manners are not part of the unclean spirits. Godliness and good manners go together, but not godliness, but not ungodliness and good manners. And so the writer of Proverbs fittingly describes the unclean seductress. And I'm going to close with this. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 11. We're going to close with this scripture. We're going to look at how Proverbs fitly describes the unclean seductress. Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 11. Note how Proverbs fitly describes, fitly describes the unclean seductress. Now, I hate to close on this note, but it's Bible. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 11. Note what it says. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet about not in her house. Isn't that something? She is loud. Not only is she loud, but she's stubborn. And her feet about not in her house. All right. Uh, if the Lord is willing, we will uh, uh, pick up uh, from this point and move forward. But once again, I want to thank those of you who have joined us by the way of Zoom. And to those of you who are online, we certainly uh, thank the Lord uh, for your uh, presence tonight. And my purpose is to grow you in the thing, to grow you in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And of course, I certainly Amen. Thank you. son. Uh, who has made it possible for us to sit in the comfort of our homes and to uh, study uh, the word of God. Amen. Of course, if there's any questions Amen. as we go along, you know, please use our chat um, chat situation. And of course, uh, I can bring it up and my son can bring it up and we can answer some questions that you all might have as we go along. Amen. But... Child of God, child of God, please keep in mind, we are in a war. We are fighting against an unseen enemy. And the devil is organized. There yes. is such a thing as organized evil. And we don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand there is evil in this world. You got to agree with the fact there is evil in this world. And it flows from none other than Satan, who is the prince of darkness 
And all the unclean spirits, all the demon spirits are under his control. He has a kingdom. Mm -hmm. He has a kingdom. And he is the God, small g, of this world. Mm -hmm. He is the God, small g, of this world. Now, I just uh, got a, 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 a message from my son, and he, he says that last week Bible study is on the website. So everything that we went over last Wednesday is now on the website. If you care okay. to go to our website, is uh, www.ebcwilmington.org and go to the menu, media, uh, and look under, if you want to look at the sermons or you look at Bible studies, uh, you click on that and go right to the Bible study uh, that you so desire to uh, uh, listen to. But once again, he's made it possible. <laughs> I've said it so many times. Junior. Me, we still be in the 20th century. <laughs> but my Thank son you. has allowed us to come into the 21st century. Amen. Yeah. Thank God for his giftedness. Reverend Junior. All that he's doing. Yeah. I'll tell you, he's really. What's your uh, wife's first so name? My son. What's her first name? And I thank God for him. I thank God for him. All right, uh, you know what I'm getting ready to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here it is. I'll see you in church. And God Thank bless you and have a good night. Amen. Good night. Uh, Mother Lee, your first name is Marlo. Good night, everyone. What's your wife's first name? Marlo. 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 Yes. M A R L O. Yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.